Singapore is one of the rainiest places on Earth. Torrential downpours fall almost every other day, and yet, this island nation is one of the most water-insecure nations in the world. At first glance, it doesn't make sense. Singapore is a tropical island with heavy rainfall. In fact, on average, it rains about 2,400 millimeters each year, nearly three times the global average. If water is falling from the sky almost daily, how could the country possibly struggle with shortages? The problem is geography. Singapore is just 728 square kilometers in size, smaller than New York City. With such a dense and urbanized landscape, rainwater doesn't soak into the ground. It rushes off the concrete and straight into the sea. Unlike larger nations, Singapore has no big rivers or lakes to store freshwater, and its underground aquifers are tiny. At the same time, demand is enormous. Over 6 million people live here, along with industries, shipping ports, and one of the world's busiest airports. That kind of consumption requires a steady and secure water supply every single day. And for much of its modern history, Singapore didn't have one. Instead, the island depended heavily on imported water from Malaysia. In times of political tension, that lifeline was never guaranteed. Leaders understood that, without water, Singapore's independence itself could be at risk. This is the paradox of Singapore, surrounded by rain, but constantly at risk of running dry. It's a challenge that shaped the country's history, its politics, and ultimately its entire identity. So how did Singapore go from being one of the most water insecure nations in the world to one of the most resilient? Singapore's water story goes back long before its independence. During the British colonial era, the island relied on a patchwork of wells, small reservoirs, and rainwater collection. As the population grew, those supplies quickly became inadequate. By the early 20th century, the British began building reservoirs to capture stormwater. McRitchie Reservoir, Salitre, and later Pierce Reservoir became the backbone of supply. But even then, demand outpaced capacity. Singapore was already looking across the causeway to Malaysia. In 1927, the first water agreement was signed, allowing Singapore to draw water from the Johor River in southern Malaysia. Later, two more long-term agreements were struck. The 1961 agreement, which allowed Singapore to draw raw water from the Tibro and Skudai rivers, and the 1962 agreement, which gave Singapore the right to draw up to 250 million gallons per day from the Johor River. These contracts became lifelines, but they also exposed Singapore's greatest vulnerability. The 1961 agreement lasted for 50 years and expired in 2011, after which Singapore handed over the waterworks and pumping stations it had built and maintained to Johor, free of charge and in good working condition. The 1962 agreement, however, is still in force and will run until 2061. To ensure reliable supply, Singapore and Johor also agreed in 1990 to build the Linggu Reservoir, with Singapore covering more than $230 million in costs to secure its water rights. But treaties alone didn't guarantee security. In 1963 and 1964, a severe drought hit the region and Singapore went through nearly 10 months of rationing. Taps were turned off for hours every day, and families queued at public standpipes with buckets. For many, it was the moment when water insecurity became real. When Singapore separated from Malaysia in 1965, the issue of water was not an afterthought. It was at the center of survival. The agreements were written into the very terms of independence and guaranteed by Malaysia's constitution. That meant every drop that flowed from Johor across the causeway was both essential and politically sensitive. Singapore's founding prime minister, Lee Kuan Yew, often said that water was a matter of national security. He knew that a country could live without oil, but not without water. And if Malaysia ever decided to cut off that supply, Singapore's independence would be meaningless. That fear drove decades of planning, urgency, and innovation. The goal was clear, to build a system so resilient that Singapore would never again have to beg for water. By the 1970s, Singapore knew that depending on Malaysia forever was too risky. The government needed a long-term plan, one that would guarantee water even if every external source disappeared. That plan became known as the Four National Taps. The idea was simple but powerful. Never rely on a single source. Build multiple overlapping systems so that if one fails, the others can keep the taps running. Today, the Four National Taps remain the foundation of Singapore's water security. The first tap is imported water. Under the 1961 and 1962 agreements, Singapore could draw raw water from the Johor River in Malaysia, treat it, and supply its people. For decades, this was the bulk of Singapore's supply, but it also came with political tension, especially during disputes between the two neighbors. Leaders knew this tap would not last forever. The last agreement expires in 2061. 
The second tap is local catchment water. If you look at a map of Singapore today, you'll notice something unusual. Despite being one of the most urbanized countries on Earth, nearly two-thirds of its land is used as water catchment. The entire island has been engineered to act like one big rain collector. The logic is simple. Rainfall is plentiful, but without storage, it's useless. So Singapore built a vast network of drains, canals, and stormwater systems designed to capture every drop. These channels feed into 17 reservoirs spread across the island island, each acting like a giant storage tank for rain. But Singapore's relationship with water isn't just about scarcity. Paradoxically, it's also about having too much of it. With tropical storms and some of the heaviest rainfall in the world, flooding has always been a threat. In the past, even ordinary monsoon showers could swamp low-lying streets. Instead of treating water shortage and flooding as separate problems, Singapore designed a system that tackles both at once. The drains, canals, and reservoirs that capture rainwater for supply also serve as defenses against floods. Stormwater is quickly channeled into storage instead of spilling into neighborhoods. This way, every drop of rain is either collected for future use or diverted safely out to sea. The Marina Barrage is the most striking example. Built across the Marina Channel, it transformed a tidal bay into a massive freshwater reservoir. Today, it supplies about 10% of Singapore's water needs, while doubling as a flood barrier that protects the downtown financial district. On weekends, it even serves as a public park where families gather, turning a piece of critical infrastructure into a shared community space. Even highly urbanized areas like Changi Airport or residential estates are designed with water collection in mind. Rain that falls on runways, rooftops and roads doesn't just disappear into drains, it's funneled into the system, cleaned and added to reservoirs. The third tap is new water. For decades, Singapore's leaders knew that rainfall and imports alone wouldn't be enough. The country needed a supply that was secure, local, and renewable. The answer came from an unlikely source, sewage. In the 1970s, Singapore began experimenting with recycling used water. Back then, the technology wasn't advanced enough. But by the 1990s, new filtration methods made it possible to take wastewater and clean it to a level even higher than ordinary tap water. This breakthrough became known as knee water. The process is rigorous. First, used water is collected and treated in conventional plants. Then it passes through microfiltration membranes, which remove particles and bacteria. Next comes reverse osmosis, where water is forced through ultra-thin membranes that block viruses, salts, and even the tiniest impurities. Finally, the water is blasted with ultraviolet disinfection, ensuring it is completely safe. The result is water so pure it exceeds World Health Organization standards. At first, the public reaction was cautious. Drinking recycled wastewater was a hard idea to swallow. To win trust, the government launched a campaign. They bottled new water and handed it out at national events. They gave bottles to foreign dignitaries. Schools were brought on tours to see the process firsthand. Slowly, skepticism turned into pride. Today, new water supplies up to 40% of Singapore's total demand, and by 2060, that share is expected to rise to over 55%. Much of it is used for industry, where ultra-clean water is essential for electronics and pharmaceutical manufacturing, but it also blends into the reservoirs, becoming part of the everyday drinking supply. New water was more than an engineering achievement. It was a psychological shift. It showed Singaporeans that nothing, not even wastewater, could be wasted, and it proved to the world that technology and and trust can turn a weakness into strength. The fourth tap is desalination. Singapore is surrounded by water. The problem is, it's all seawater, and drinking salt water is deadly. For much of history, desalination was far too expensive to be practical. But as Singapore searched for independence in water, the ocean was too big a resource to ignore. In 2005, the country opened its first large-scale desalination plant in Tuas. Using reverse osmosis, seawater was forced through membranes that strip away salt and minerals, leaving behind fresh, drinkable water. It was energy-intensive and costly, but it worked. Since then, desalination has grown into a critical pillar of the four national taps. Today, Singapore has five desalination plants, together capable of supplying about 30% of the nation's daily needs. They ensure that, even during droughts or dry spells, Singaporeans never have to worry about their taps running dry. But desalination comes with challenges. Energy demand is high, about three times more than producing new water. Running the plants also costs more than drawing from reservoirs. For a country with no oil or gas, that means desalination is both a blessing blessing and a burden. To overcome this, Singapore is investing in innovation. New research focuses on energy-efficient membranes, renewable power desalination, and hybrid plants that combine solar energy with seawater treatment. The goal is to make desalination sustainable enough to serve as a permanent safety net.
For Singapore, desalination is the ultimate guarantee. The sea may not provide cheap water, but it provides certainty. And in a country where every drop counts, certainty is priceless. Singapore's water security is not just about technology, it's also about people. From the very beginning, the government understood that no system could survive if citizens treated water carelessly. Conservation had to become part of daily life. That's why public campaigns have been a constant feature for decades. Slogans like every drop counts are not just words, they reflect a mindset drilled into schools, workplaces, and households. Children grow up learning that water is precious, and many remember visiting new water plants on school trips. By the time they're adults, the idea that water must never be wasted is second nature. Pricing also plays a role. Unlike in many countries where water is heavily subsidized, Singapore deliberately keeps tariffs at levels that reflect its true cost. In 2017, the government raised water prices by 30% to encourage conservation. While unpopular at first, it sent a clear message. If you waste water, you'll feel it in your bill. There are also strict efficiency standards. New buildings are required to install water-efficient fittings. Appliances like washing machines and dishwashers are labeled with water ratings, much like energy ratings. Even industries face strict recycling targets, with many factories required to reuse a portion of their water on site. And the results are clear. In the 1990s, the average Singaporean used about 165 liters per day. Today, that number is closer to 141 liters, and the government has set a goal of 130 by 2030. For comparison, many Western countries average over 250 liters per person. Singapore didn't just build a water system. It built a culture where wasting water feels unthinkable. That cultural shift has been just as important as any dam, pipeline, or desalination plant. What began as a desperate struggle for survival Survival has turned Singapore into one of the world's leading hubs for water innovation. The country didn't just solve its own problem, it turned water management into an industry, an export, and even a form of diplomacy. At the center of this is PUB, Public Utilities Board, Singapore's National Water Agency. It is not just a utility provider, it's also a research and development powerhouse. Through facilities like the Water Hub and partnerships with global universities, Singapore has become a testbed for cutting-edge technologies, from next-generation filtration membranes to smart sensors that monitor water quality in real time. Water security has also allowed Singapore to grow in ways that would have been unthinkable otherwise. Its electronics industry, which requires vast amounts of ultra-pure water, thrives because new water can supply it. Its population has nearly doubled since independence, yet taps still run reliably. Even during dry years, Singaporeans don't face the kind of rationing or shortages seen in many other parts of the world. What was once the country's greatest vulnerability has become one of its defining strengths. Singapore is no longer at the mercy of geography. But its success is not just a local achievement, it's a case study for a planet that's running out of fresh water. The United Nations warns that by 2050, more than 2.5 billion people could be living in countries facing severe water scarcity. Already, almost a quarter of the global population lives under what's called extremely high water stress, where demand is greater than supply, and the numbers are climbing every year. We've already seen how devastating that can be. In 2018, Cape Town, South Africa nearly became the first major city in the world to hit day zero, the day when taps would completely stop running. Residents were restricted to just 50 liters per person per day, less than what a single shower can consume. In Chennai, India, in 2019, millions of people queued at tankers for water when the city's main reservoirs ran completely dry. Even in wealthy countries, the problem is growing. The western United States has watched the Colorado River shrink to historic lows, threatening supplies for cities like Las Vegas, Phoenix, and Los Angeles. Against this backdrop, Singapore is unique. It has no large rivers, no aquifers, and no natural water reserves. Yet it has built a system so secure that households and industries never face shortages. Every drop is captured, treated, and reused. Where many nations still lose up to 30% of their water to leaks and inefficiency, Singapore keeps losses to just about 5%, one of the lowest rates in the world. That's why governments and engineers from around the globe look to Singapore as a model. Delegations from the Middle East, China, and Africa regularly visit the country to study its methods. The Singapore International Water Week, held every two years, attracts thousands of global experts to learn how to replicate parts of its system. And Singapore's water technology companies now export desalination and recycling expertise to countries as far apart as Saudi Arabia, India, and Australia. For Singapore, water security was a matter of survival. For the rest of the world, it's becoming a matter of urgency. And while every country's geography is different, the lesson from Singapore is clear. Planning ahead, investing in technology, and shaping public behavior can turn scarcity into resilience.
However, for all its progress, Singapore's water story is not one of triumph, and then happily ever after, the challenges ahead may be even tougher than those of the past. The first is climate change. Rainfall in Southeast Asia is becoming less predictable, with longer dry spells followed by more intense storms. Reservoirs that once filled quickly may face drought, while sudden downpours can overwhelm drains and spill precious water into the sea. Rising sea levels also threaten to contaminate coastal reservoirs with saltwater intrusion. The second is energy use. Desalination and new water recycling both rely heavily on electricity, and as demand rises, so does the carbon footprint. Singapore is now pushing for renewable-powered desalination plants and next-generation membranes that consume less energy, but balancing water security with sustainability will be a constant struggle. The third is growing demand. By 2060, Singapore's total water use is projected to double, driven by population growth and industry. The electronics and pharmaceutical sectors alone need vast quantities of ultra-clean water. Even with conservation and efficiency, supplying that demand will stretch the system to its limits. These challenges mean Singapore cannot afford to slow down. Its survival has always depended on planning decades ahead, and the next decades will test whether its model of resilience can withstand a hotter, drier, and more uncertain world. Singapore's story shows how even a country with almost no natural water can survive, and even thrive, if it plans far enough ahead. But the bigger question is, what about the rest of the world? As droughts worsen and rivers dry up, will other nations be willing to recycle wastewater the way Singapore does? And can they match Singapore's discipline where every drop truly counts. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.